Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to what is, amazingly enough, the very last uh, of the noon conferences for this academic year. Uh, hard to imagine that uh, the year is coming to a close, uh, but it is. And so uh, it's a real pleasure for me to introduce today's speaker. Um, we saved the best to last. Uh, so uh, uh, Dr. John Tilbert is professor of medicine and biomedical ethics, as well as a practicing integrative medicine physician at the Mayo Clinic in Phoenix. Um, he is uh, originally from the Eastern shore of Lake Michigan. Um, he uh, got degrees in philosophy, medicine, and public health, uh, as well as doing postdoctoral fellowships in Baltimore, DC, and Bethesda. Um, he moved to the Mayo Clinic uh, Minnesota in 2007, um, and then has subsequently uh, moved to uh, Phoenix. Uh, Dr. Tilbert uh, focuses uh, most of his work on improving relationships in healthcare using the lenses of ethics, cancer care delivery, health equity, and the power of patient stories. Um, of note, he's received numerous grants from the NIH and the Greenwall Foundation. He served on numerous ethics committees, including for the American Society of Clinical Oncology, the American College of Physicians, and the Society of General Internal Medicine. Um, at Mayo, he was Deputy Director of Biomedical Ethics Research Program uh, for five years, just uh, completing that term last year, and Medical Director of a high-volume Mayo Clinic Ethics Consult Service from 2017 to 2019. Um, uh, he is uh, passionate about writing and mentoring, um, and, and he and his colleagues have a book under contract with Cambridge University Press addressing the care of the frail elderly. And he's also working on a memoir about finding meaning in modern medicine. Um, he is currently enrolled in a mixed genre MFA in spiritual writing. Um, uh, uh, he and his wife, Jackie, uh, live in Phoenix, as I said. Uh, most importantly, they cheer for Michigan football, uh, and they have uh, uh, four children, ages uh, 23 to 15, and uh, a middle-aged mini golden doodle named Maisie Blue. And so if that is not meaningful to you, then you're not from the Midwest. Um, so anyway, John, it's really uh, been a pleasure uh, spending time with you this morning. Thank you very much for being here today. We're honored to have you. I'm putting the leadership to work here. It's a pleasure to be here. We're going to try to be countercultural today, and I'm going to get out of my own comfort zone. So I hope by the end of this hour, something will uh, irritate or disturb you or, uh, uh, or maybe even inspire uh, you about the work of ethics. Um, I'm going to start with an odd question, but it's a question I've been asking myself and what people ask me lately is, what have you been reading? Why would I be asking that question? You could also ask the question, what is the quality of your reading? Now, we're passing out cards and pencils, pre-sharpened. So if you're inclined, I'd love it if you wrote down something on those cards about what you've been reading or maybe the quality of your reading. I know for a long time, my reading, if it's happened at all, has been cursory, distracted, extractive, or even somnolent. Um, but I'm hoping today um, that we can think a little bit about the way that stories and narrative and how we read our lives and each other and our, our situations could deepen and influence how we think about the work of clinical ethics consultation. I'm deeply indebted to many colleagues at Mayo Clinic for, um, let's see if I can many colleagues at Mayo Clinic for a lot of different things. One thing I'm indebted to, um, to them for is uh, a retreat that was held in this house right here where everybody went around as the icebreaker in the retreat and said, what are you reading? And the answer was, oh gosh, I'm so busy with kids. I don't think I've read anything in years, um, which uh, is a sad tale, but I think too often in our busy lives, even in an ethics world, our reading and thus our 
perhaps moral imagination gets a little bit uh, flattened and stunted. I'm also very grateful to my colleagues in clinical ethics in Rochester with whom I spent several important years learning from the ground up, not from the top down, what the work of ethics consultation is and even ought to be. I'm also grateful for um, uh, a writing ment two writing mentors, Lauren Winner and uh, uh, Janine Ulay, who are helping me reimagine my career um, through creative writing. So, first exercise. If you're able to pause from your snacking and grab the pencil and paper, write down three to five words that you associate with the work of ethics consultation. And if, if you're not an ethics consultation person, whatever associations you bring to that phrase, just write them down for me. Um, and I'm not gonna be collecting these. This is more just for us to interact and think as we go along today. I'll take 10 seconds to let you write down a few words. Any bold souls want to share what they wrote down? There's a bold surgeon. Nice, looking at the big picture and zooming out. Very nice. Any others? Yeah. Third party communicator, nice. Sorting out the dynamics of the team. I like that. Yeah. Aiming for mutual understanding. Great. Good. Yes. Treating moral distress. Did you say treating? Okay. Great. Okay. Good. Well, we got our juices flowing now. We're ready to do this. Well, when I uh, sometimes I think when we think about ethics consultations, we typically think about frameworks. If um, if you are like me, oftentimes I'm thinking about what fields in the note have to be populated and what sets of considerations need to be accounted for. And of course, we're all familiar with the medical indications. Anybody who's done any sort of kind of uh, ethics consultation familiar with medical indication, quality of life, patient preferences, and contextual features. This is one of many potential frameworks or methods or approaches that are often uh, proposed. And um, as is similarly to, to this framework from the American College of Physicians, I'm an internist, um, and this is the framework uh, set out in their ethics manual. And these frameworks are good as far as they go. Um, they help us organize things. Um, but I think there's a temptation often in the work of ethics consultation to somehow um, lose, uh, lose sight of kind of a broader contextual approach, even when context is listed as one of the sets of considerations. And so um, today what I want to do is to step back and spend some time thinking about that work of ethics consultation, kind of going meta about the work, as it were, um, just for a minute. Going and hopefully as a concluding kind of lecture for a lecture series for people who are maybe newly in the world of clinical ethics to kind of imagine what the, the 2.0 version of clinical ethics consultation might be for you in your career um, if you happen to go in that direction. And maybe taking us a little bit from the sort of rough carpentry work of frameworks to something more like fine boutique cabinetry in terms of um, getting to um, a kind of work in clinical ethics that has a degree of both complexity and elegance to it. So I have a bit of an empirical assertion that I wanna put in front of you today. And it goes like this. Most of ethics consultation as it has been typically taught focuses on principles and procedures, discursive reasoning, and dichotomies of permissibility and or legality, okay? So if somebody calls you and says, well, we don't have a decision maker, or, you know, what's on the advanced directive, or, um, you know, there's family conflict, right? 
I think typically the way that um, we often communicate about and formally teach clinical ethics, we tend to um, focus on principles, procedures, discursive reasoning, and these um, language of permissibility or legality. Now I want to offer a slight adaptation from that, which is a hypothesis. Ethics consultation in its most exemplary practice incorporates moral imagination drawn from narrative to cultivate broader ethics sensibilities. Doesn't deny the frameworks, but it cultivates broader ethics sensibilities. And highlighting these connections can help redefine what the work of ethics consultation ought to be, even if every day it doesn't meet that expectation. Clinical ethics is, or at least ought to be, narratively inspired and infused with imagination, moral imagination. That's where we're going. Hopefully that'll become obvious as we go. So first, narrative medicine. No narrative medicine talk would be complete without narrative. So here we go. Robert Earl Tilbert, my grandfather, married Catherine Hoffmeyer in 1932. He was 18, she 16. Throughout the 1930s, they lived in places like Grand Blanc, Lansing, and Nashville, Michigan, working odd jobs, trying to farm, raising six kids, learning life the hard way. Finally, in 1952, he got a factory job, a steady one, at a GM subsidiary. They moved to a small town called Hastings, and he drove to Battle Creek to the Fisher Body Factory for the next 22 years. Then, fresh off retirement, he was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in 1974 at the age of 60. By the time I could remember, maybe 1976, he'd been sick a while. Every meal and bedtime we prayed. Then in the fall of 77, after years of treatment, West Michigan doctors ran out of options. So grandpa and grandma decided they'd go to Mayo's, that older colloquial name given by customers cared for by the founding brothers of Mayo Clinic. For their generation, the plural possessive of the apostrophe was personal. In Rochester, grandpa and grandma filled their days with tests and consultations the way pilgrims still do. To and from appointments back and forth to their efficiency apartment, they went. Soon he was admitted to Methodist Hospital for labored breathing, then transferred to the ICU. Lung inflammation, infection or radiation injury, they thought. An aunt flew out to be with grandma, who was known simply as Tilly her small town single name Baptist celebrity equivalent to Beyonce or Adele or something. Then our phone rang. Tilly's nasal voice quivered through the line from Rochester. Daddy's real sick. The next day, mom and dad dropped my sister and me at our other grandparents and flew to Rochester. In a dim room down a side corridor, I'd walk decades later on a Tuesday in early November 1977, Tilly agreed to have the ventilator withdrawn from Grandpa. That Saturday, everyone gathered at Hastings Baptist. Dad's back pocket hanky sopped his wet face as we walked past a fancy padded wooden box displaying Grandpa's gaunt form. The electric organ warbled as if it too had a lump in its throat. Dying at 63 felt a whole lot shorter than the three score and 10 the scriptures called a full life. Those plans to go see America, just he and Tilly together, pulling their little airstream, dead. The pastor approached the elevated pulpit, gripping his big black worn Bible, a red ribbon marked 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Therefore, we are always confident knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing, rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. All the people nodded. We sang, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. My four-year-old mind spun. Whatever this was, it was not blessed, not assuring, anything but 
In the coming years, that day lingered in my racing mind. Dad and some uncles placed that box in a bulging black station wagon. Slowly, we followed that station wagon, orange flags flapping, turning west down the road along the river until we came to the gravel driveway near a tent on a hill. Then we stepped out into a brisk wind. Dried brown oak leaves blew across our freshly polished shoes. More verses were read, more strange words spoken. The heaviness lingered. Then they lowered the box and we all returned to the church. The adults ate potato salad and meatballs in the basement as if it were normal, just like a wedding, just no mints and Spanish peanuts. The kids went outside playing hide and seek in the fading afternoon light. That's narrative medicine. That also happens to be the origin story of my career. And I would say five years ago, I would have never read something like that in a lecture. But I think narrative is so important to the work of ethics consultation, work that I've learned from colleagues, that uh, infusing more story into uh, our descriptions of the work of ethics becomes more and more important. Decades later, I read Wendell Berry's Fidelity, Grandpa and Grandma. I'm going to share an excerpt because it's just too good. This is the story of Burley Coulter who gets sick and his family takes him to the hospital. Danny and Nathan took him to Louisville, submitted to the long interrogation required for admission, saw him undressed and gowned and put to bed by a jolly nurse and left him. As they were going out, he said, boys, why don't you all wait for me yonder by the gate? I've got this one last round to make and then we'll all go in together. They did not know from what field or what year he was talking. Burley was too weak for surgery, the doctor told them the next day. It would be necessary to build up his strength. In the meantime, tests would be for performed. When they returned, they found the old body still as it had been, a mere passive addition to the complicated machines that kept it minimally alive. They saw it finally that in their attempt to help, they had not helped, but only complicated his disease beyond their power to help. Loving him, wanting to help them, him, they had given him over to the best of modern medical care, which meant, as they now saw, that they had abandoned him. I share this story in part because I love reading Wendell Berry short stories, and in part because I want you to begin to feel the distance between a typical ethics consultation and what narrative medicine has to offer. A typical ethics consultation, in my experience, at least in the pedagogical aspects of my experience involve concepts and discursive reasoning, thinking about right and wrong, good and bad dichotomies. Uh, it's very procedural and it often is distilling. Uh, I, I myself am even intolerant of the long passage that I read to you about my grandfather. Why would that be? Well, I think it's in part because of our own sense of clinical sort of, come on, let's get on with it, right? Um, and this need for closure and conclusion, right? That's an inevitable part of what we do in clinical care. Um, but I think what narrative medicine introduces us to is the importance of story and imagination, of course, and, and, and creates anticipation, right? That's what narrative arcs do. Uh, creates suspense, delay, and elaboration as a way of actually, in the end, creating more pleasure and more satisfaction from what's going on. Um, and of course, Narrative is always open to reinterpretation. So imagine what I just read to you about Burley Coulter, and then imagine this summary. An 82-year-old rural dwelling man presented as a direct admit from a private practice with a chief complaint from the family of confusion and somnolence. 
A potentially operable problem was identified, but the surgical team deemed him too weak and admitted him to the medicine service for hydration, empiric antibiotics for a presumed UTI and possible urinary obstruction. Throughout the patient's course, family visited frequently, though the patient's mentation was such that he could not provide consent. Instead, his nephew authorized all necessary treatments. GI was consulted for a G-tube placement. The family have been present at the bedside and involved, though their education level seems limited. So if you can imagine the distance between the story I started narrating for you about Burley Coulter, which is incidentally 85 pages long, um, and my summary, right? That's the gap I think we need to start closing in the if we want to do the work of ethics consultation well. And that's what I hope it will, will be more possible in your mind at the end of this hour than it was maybe at the beginning. There is, of course, this dialogical relationship between these two approaches, right? No, narrative medicine is not opposed to a procedural ethics consultation approach, but there's a way in which we can become allergic to narrative medicine in the procedural doing of the ethics consult work if our lives are so chuck full with moving forward with things that we blunt the next thing I'm gonna talk about, which is moral imagination. I think moral imagination is the thing that actually links narrative medicine and ethics consultation. And if we're open to narrative medicine, moral imagination can actually be the thing that helps inspire that sort of craftsman, craftsperson level refined finishing of the work and brings us beyond the rough carpentry of doing ethics consultation. This is not a directly translatable skill so much as it is a sensibility. Has anybody here ever worked with like a, an interior designer? Okay, I hadn't until this year, but I can't describe for you how they pick stuff out. I just know what they do is better than what I would pick out, right? So it, it, it's a sensibility right, that you adapt over time. It, it, and you could say an aesthetic sensibility, right? When I, um, when I write summaries of books for my writing mentors, the bottom line is, does this work or not, right? Does it work? Does it fall on the ear in a pleasant way and actually reinforce the case you're trying to make? And I think that's what I'm trying to ad ad advocate for, is that sensibility. So the official definition for a moral imagination, according to the uh, Encyclopedia Britannica Online, is the presumed mental capacity to create or use ideas, images, and metaphors not derived from moral principles or immediate observation to discern moral truths or to develop moral responses. My seat of the pants informal unofficial um, definition is exercising wonder and curiosity about the lived experiences, circumstances, and inner reality of other beings. I'm trying to be inclusive of my dog, Maisie Blue. Um, including reinterpreting one's understanding of the moral landscape of those beings prior to reasoning about intervening in or rendering judgments about the rightness or wrongness of their situation. Okay. I think these are fundamentally compatible. I just wanted to say it my own way. Well, there's, I'm not actually saying anything new. So if you put moral imagination into your Amazon search screen, you get all sorts of uh, results that pretty much look like a uh, faculty seminar series in the Committee for Social Thought, right? Like this is a known thing, but if you put ethics and moral imagination into PubMed, you get eight results and none of them are relevant. You can try it this afternoon. Um, the point is there's all sorts of um, wisdom that can be gleaned from a certain um, perspective that I think at least I, I'm not, I haven't read any of these books, right? Why am I like 51 and have never read these books, but I claim to be like an ethicist and like do ethics consultation, right? It tells you sort of the blind spots that we create in our own little silos of the universe. 
So um, I'm trying to create, you know, correct some of this in term, in, in some of my creative writing work in terms of being open to a more kind of aesthetic sensibility into everyday life. Um, but I got to say, it take, took, took a long time to get there. Um, and I'm hoping you can get there before I have. So before long, if we're going to talk about moral imagination, it's really just the other side of the coin, so to speak, um, of narrative ethics. Now, I'm no expert in any of this, right? I'm a novice to all of this, right? I didn't... I, I would rather read Kant than read Harry Potter. Okay. So like, I don't, I don't have any expertise here, but what I do know is that um, moral imagination goes hand in hand with narr what people have called narrative ethics. So I'll give you a third ass assertion, which is that moral imagination or wondering about how to render a version of situations that resonates or fits at least can be, um, or can at least be stomached by all the people involved, gets us really into this space of what has been called narrative ethics. So according to the authority of Wikipedia, narrative ethics is an approach that focuses on personal identity through story and particular events in the life story of the individual or community. These form a basis for ethical reflection and learning, both for individuals or groups. In many respects, it resembles or presupposes virtue. There's a lot packed in there that we're not gonna be able to fully unpack, but I just wanna make sure that this, uh, category of thinking is not completely off your radar as you enter the world of clinical ethics. If at the in the middle of your career, you get to the point where you think a lot of what you do, you've been doing maybe isn't as meaningful or feels a little stale or shallow or empty, perhaps you need a, a, a reboot in the vocabulary and the richness of the vocabulary that you bring to that work. Of course, you wouldn't want to necessarily take my word for it because I'm not an expert, um, but a lot of other experts have talked about this too. So this is another problem in terms of academia, but also in terms of the history of bioethics is that in about four years, we forget what people have already said in bioethics. Um, and so I want to take you to um, the manifest experts in these spheres. Uh, so R Rita Sharon, arguably sort of the, the queen mother of narrative medicine. Um, in a chapter she wrote for this uh, a volume called Stories Matter. The, let's see, I can't even read that. I can't read the subtitle, that's okay. She says that narrative medicine nudges ethics toward intersubjectivity, phenomenology, particularity, what is good in care, like the actual act of care, fosters a capacity for courage, which I don't hear talked about very much, um, embraces complexity, embraces word connotations, um, including the words we throw around all the time, like do everything, and often cultivates discernment and humility. And because stories have to have action, right? Stuff has to happen for it to be a story. Consequences of action and inaction are paramount in the narrative medicine imagination. I found this very helpful when I read this chapter by Rita. And you should take her word for it, not mine. Well, it turns out that the uh, one of the chief um, journals in our field, the Hastings Center Report, also had a theme issue on the role of stories in bioethics a, de a decade ago. Again, I, I've subscribed to the Hastings Center report since I was like 13, but did I read this volume? No, I did not read that volume until I was preparing for this talk. So uh, let me show you what a few um, people have said um, about stories and bioethics. And this is a nice summary from Brody and Clark about narrative ethics. Narrative ethics can help interpret and specify principles, 
It supports a relational and virtue-based accounts of morality. It can make sense of and help interpret experience. It can link values to action. It can situate right action in bigger stories, right? Everybody's story is situated in other layers of stories. Um, and it can permit us to live with in indeterminacy, right? So what researchers would call tolerance for ambiguity, right? Or tolerance for uncertainty. Indeterminacy is just a part of life, right? Um, which we like to often reduce by our nice, tidy little clinical summaries. So narrative ethics also cultivates imaginations for life's possibilities, links virtues to life, et cetera. You can see the whole list here. I like to just um, point out the def defies oversimplification here. I think that that's a really important one. When we're trying, when I, when I went from being a third year medical student to a fourth year medical student, I learned how to simplify, right? The attendings were no longer tolerant of my unwieldy kind of meandering history of present illness, right? It had to, it had to be going somewhere, right? And good narrative is always going somewhere. But I think in our haste to, um, to simplify, it's very common to oversimplify. And narrative ethics can remind us of the perils of doing so. Back to uh, Rita Sharon. So in that volume, Rita Sharon also wrote about narrative reciprocity. And I'll just read this quote. She was writing about the task of writing and making sense of her own clinical experience through writing. She said, writing not only helped me see the couple with clarity, but also enabled me to see myself in the mirror of their gaze. Writing helps me to expose my thoughts. So the nice thing about this, I think, is really, uh, you know, the way in which if you think about it, all therapists need a therapist, right? Like all ethics consultants need to be self-reflective about they, what they do and how they show up to that work, right? And for Sharon, she, she does that with writing. There's a lot of different ways you could do that. Um, but this, I, this, this relationship between telling, listening, giving, and receiving is a reciprocal relationship, either in the clinical uh, environment or in the clinical ethics environment. And uh, acknowledging that and cultivating those sensibilities is super important. Okay, so that brings us to the work of ethics consultation. What really is the work? If you still have your card, if you didn't put it in your lunchbox or wad it up yet quite yet, I wonder, Having now thought a little bit more, obviously this is a selective audience, you knew what the title of the talk was before you came. I wonder if you might add anything to your, your description or your mental image of what the work of ethics consultation is. Teaser, I can share mine after the talk if you really want. Well, um, I'm just curious, anybody, did anybody add anything that anybody want to offer a, a, men, a friendly amendment to what they had written earlier? Okay, that's great. All right. I think part of what we're talking here is the difference between what the work is and what the work ought to be, right? So the is-ought distinction in, in bioethics is a constant one, right? There's the world as it is and the world as it ought to be, right? Well, we can think about that same distinction in the work of ethics consultation, right? When you um, say that you got paged for an ethics consult, but you're in the middle of clinic and that you have to uh, cover for a colleague and you have to buzz over to the hospital and you have to get, a, get to a soccer game and you have a morning report at 7 a.m. the next day, right? That's when the questions of how you show up to the work of ethics consults is really gonna meet the rub, right? Are, are, is there going to be space in your life to actually show up in a, in a morally imaginative way to that consult? Well, not always, right? Sometimes it's just the work. Sometimes you just got to get something in the chart so they can go to the OR, right? But uh, reminding ourselves that there, that's what the work is and what the work ought to be or what the work might be if we allowed it to be, I think is an important 
uh, mental frame, especially when we start thinking about sort of national standards and certification, it's so easy to focus on the floor of competency that we lose sight of the aspirational heavens, so to speak, of the work. And that's what this talk is inevitably about. So part of the power of stories and creative writing is, it, is exactly what we're talking about today. I'm going to now read you um, the ending of the story about my grandpa again. And then I'm going to read you a new version. Just to refresh your memory, this is the original version that you heard. Dad and some uncles placed that box in a bulging black station wagon. Slowly, we followed that station wagon, orange flags flapping, turning west down the road along the river until we came to the gravel drive near a tent on a hill. Then we stepped out into a brisk wind. Dried brown oak leaves blew across our freshly polished shoes. More verses were read, more strange words spoken. The heaviness lingered. Then they lowered the box and we all returned to the church. The adults ate potato salad and meatballs in the basement as if it were normal, just like a wedding, just no mints and Spanish peanuts. The kids weren't out, went outside playing hide and seek in the fading afternoon light. First ver that was first version. Okay, deep breath. This is what I wrote two years later. Dad and uncles and cousins lifted that box into a bulging black station wagon. We rode through town, orange flags flapping, turning west along the river. Then near a tent on a hill in a brisk November breeze, more verses were read, more strange words spoken. The pastor prayed, they lowered the box, and it was done. Matter of fact, everybody returned to the church basement, processing through a buffet of potato salad and meatballs. Church ladies with horn glasses poured punch. Children went out to play, and soon in the basement, out of nowhere, the air shifted. First a little chatter, then with more and more hugs, little snippets of laughter rippled through the cold silence. Soon, something unexpected settled there, something approximating what I now call peace. There was no ethics consult involved in any of this, okay? That's not the point. The point is that the creative writer, and I hope the imag morally imaginative ethics consultant, has at their disposal, if they choose, the ability to reimagine stories, to reimagine versions of stories, to, to help others reimagine versions of their story, to wonder out loud whether the way we've characterized what's going on is really what's going on, or all that's going on. And if we avail ourselves of the tools of narrative medicine and moral imagination, what kind of possibilities might emerge from that? So with, um, with uh, uh, acknowledgement to um, Arthur Frank, I'd like to propose that maybe the work of ethics consultation is often nothing more than this. Searching for a version of the story everyone can live with. This is what he mentioned to me when he was visiting Mayo Clinic about seven years ago. And I wasn't even aware of the volume that he had contributed to um, at the time. But in that Hastings Center volume, he talks about ethics consultation as dialogical storytelling. He says, um, narrative ethics as dialogical storytelling tells us a few things. First, that the patient and family are the priority. Second, that um, life is fundamentally imagined through story and that most people wanna do the right thing. And th but they need help imagining best actions. Of course, narrative medicine doesn't outline clean and tidy procedures. So it's best at actually preventing breakdowns, right? We can't solve everything with narrative medicine, but we can remain open to a more imaginative work of clinical ethics even when breakdowns do occur. There are multiple points of view. There is opportunity to constantly revise our version of the story of what's going on. And stories stall when dialogue breaks down. 
hence the dialogical storytelling nature of the work. And maybe the work of ethics consultation is really enabling others to find their own best way and to help people get unstuck and recognizing that a lot of what we're dealing with is contingent and adaptive and just a tactful sort of reframing of what's going on. I think many of us have this deep feeling that uh, a lot of the consults we get called on aren't fundamentally ethics issues, right? Well, they're not fundamentally ethics issues if we've already imposed a certain kind of a very rigid sense of what ethics is, right? But if ethics includes people's life stories, right, and navigating them and helping them reconcile versions of their life story, then maybe um, there is an ethics issue. It's just more of a narrative ethics issue, right? Or a lack of moral imagination to see how your, your take on things fits with the take of another. I don't think any of this solves the hard work, but I hope it keeps us open. Excuse me, frog in my throat. <laughs> keeps us open to a different way of doing ethics that hopefully over time can become a craft and an art, not just a job. There's a way of doing ethics consults that reads the texts, the people and the situations of our lives slowly, relationally and immersively, not just extractively. That's the kind of person I wanna be. That's the kind of ethics consult work I wanna engage in. In the words of Arthur Frank, uh, we need to let our stories breathe, let other stories breathe, and not flatten them prematurely in our attempts to gain uh, closure and quick answers and tidy up the chart. With a bit of imagination, I think that's possible and might actually be efficient in some circumstances. I'd have to think more about that. Uh, but I think that's why ethics consultants need to be better readers so that we can help others be better storytellers in our lives and in our work. So thank you for listening and I'll look forward to the conversation. Is this, is this, how, how does this go? Hello. Yep. Um, thank you for your talk. I really appreciated it. Um, I would say my biggest question or kind of your perspective on narrative ethics as it relates to kind of the overarching goal of socially and culturally cognizant medical practice and how those are different or similar and how those work together. Oh, very good question. Um. I'm gonna repeat the question just to make sure I understand and to make sure that the recording grabbed it all. So um, how do we understand narrative ethics as it relates to um, culturally competent um, interactions and care um, and how are they similar or different perhaps, right? Well, um, you know, the word narrative can mean a lot of different things, right? Um, it's not that all stories tell us morally exemplary things. And um, narrative is also something that's used in, in uh, marketing or on K Street to um, uh, spin a story, right? And so uh, I think it's really important that uh, uh, there's, a, there's a quote from Alistair McIntyre that says that, you know, the, um, the kinds of people we become are tied to the stories that we claim or something like that, right? So it matters what stories we claim, right? Not just any story. Um, so I don't think that narrative medicine by itself solves all the problems we have about um, cultural humility and deep listening and the need to slow down, but I do think there might be some opportunities to cultivate those sensibilities. Um, I will tell you that um, uh, the authors that I have read in my life um, are not nearly as diverse as they should be, right? So how much uh, James Baldwin and Alice Walker have I read, right? Very little, 
right? So that's on me, right? That's not anybody else's work but mine. Um, so I don't think there's what I what I hope is that this um, the slow imaginative reading of people in texts um, keeps us from prematurely foreclosing on when we think we have an answer without having listened. That's that's the best I hope it can do. Thank you. Uh, John, thanks. I thought that <clears throat> that was great. Uh, what really resonated with me in what you said uh, was the idea that sometimes uh, the ethics consultant can reinterpret what's going on and make it not make it necessarily easy, but make it sort of uh, a little bit more acceptable. And so I see that much more on the side of caregivers. So mm -hmm. there's this sort of moral distress about why are we doing this when mm -hmm. the results don't seem to warrant it or whatnot. Um, and sometimes just you know having ethics consultants explain that you know it's based on the idea of surrogate decision makers and them interpreting what is in the patient's best interest. And although we think we may know, we may not really know. And you know, so in that sense, it it, it, I, it seems to me that a lot of what you say really plays out for caregivers. Mm -hmm. um, could you talk a little bit about the extent to which it plays out for families? Mm. Because I'm not sure that we do as good a job for families um, in that context. I think mm. that it, you know, sometimes we do, but I'm just not sure we do as much as we perhaps could. Boy, that's a really good question. Um, a couple of thoughts come to mind in terms of families in particular. Um, uh, two related to things I mentioned briefly in the talk. Um, so Arthur Frank's book, uh, Letting Stories Breathe, um, implies a certain kind of place uh, or pace and space for people to share their version of things, right? So if you read Fidelity, the last, 70 pages of fidelity is basically his family sitting around talking to a lawyer about something that went wrong. I'm not going to tell you what went wrong. You need to read it. But the point is the story actually exemplifies this Wendell Berry theme of health is membership, right? You can't understand the, the care of this patient unless you understand the communal, geographic, cultural, whatever that this patient comes from, right? Whether it's a rural white person or whatever. Um, but um, if we create the space and pace to let family stories breathe, there are subtle ways that I think reframing can happen, right? Where there's a version that the team sees and a version that the family sees that are at least not incompatible, right? Like we're searching for not incompatible, palatable, good enoughs, right? I think that's the work in, in, a, in other words. I also, I have like a very luxurious clinical practice um, and I have like 90 minute appointments with patients. So I can just sit there. Like I can, I bill on time by the way. So I can just sit there and do a whole lot of listening. P patients with chronic pain, fatigue, fibromyalgia, None of this is fixable. And all I do is sit there, right? That's all I do. And then I, I maybe subtly speak back to them what they just told me, but in language that leaves open the possibility that their life isn't over. Um, and, I, and I wonder if there's at least some analogy there, right? That the ethics isn't in one sense doing anything in terms of creating answers so much as they're allowing people to see their own experience with a little bit more flexibility. I don't know, maybe. Yeah. Uh, 
Hi, uh, thank you so much for this talk. Um, so I, I, I speak as a philosopher, not a clinician, so just yeah. clarifying that. I, I gather one of the sort of issues with narrative medicine is precisely what, you, what came up in your, last, in your last response, that these take time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the very sort of like setting of, you know, of, of an appointment is, you know, 15 minutes, not 90. Um, and so I guess I wonder, you know, one sort of, one sort of issue is how, how we sort of, how we sort of reconcile narrative medicine with the sort of exigencies of, you know, we only have uh, X amount of time. I gather the most relevant thing for tying narrative medicine is, is sort of really teasing out a sort of more fine grained sense of like, what this patient actually wants. I remember when we were having a discussion with my dad about whether to get like an LVAD or a heart transplant mm -hmm. and like getting, you know, having the conversations of like what's most important to him. It had like this long ranging idea of like what's what he wanted his life to be. And that in a way like sort of set out of, you know, some things weren't sort of, that he wanted were actually when we talked about it more, were actually were actually ruled out, and he came to sort of see that. And I think narrative is very helpful for that. But I think the 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 exigencies of the of the time time constraints is, I think, a real challenge for this. And so I wonder if you have thoughts yeah, on no, that. I, I I agree with you. And I, um, another um, U of C uh, connection uh, in my mind is uh, uh, Jim Gustafson, who said there's four different types of moral discourse. Right there's prophetic, ethical, narrative, and policy. And to the extent that an ethics consult service or bioethics in an academic medical center give up on any of those discourses, I think they do so at their peril, right? I haven't even gotten to prophetic discourse. That's really more a talk on poetry and ethics consultation, right? Because the, the, the poetic imagination and the prophetic imagination have a lot of overlap. Um, but um, I think my point is there are times when um, ethics cannot, cannot just um, acquiesce to the prevailing powers <laughs> of, the, uh, of, the, of the machine, right? Ethics already doesn't make money, right? We should just start from the beginning knowing that it's, it's a, a, at best a loss leader, Right, but hopefully a brand distinguisher in terms of a, a place's um, passionate, you know, compassionate care, and hopefully keeps you know a few people either out of the out of the courtroom, or uh, out of uh, HR or some other intangibles. Um, the more hopefully help the highly paid people do their job better, and the medium and low paid people can do a little bit more slowing down with ethics. Um, that that's the kind of sell I think you give to ethics, but it's it's never going to make money. Um, uh, we could talk about reimbursement models because there is some variability in how different centers do this. But I, I think your point is well taken. I think the biggest challenge is believing or accepting the mindset that in fact ethics consults is also about productivity, right? As soon as we accept that mindset we've already sort of flattened the work down to the procedural. Oops. Sorry, you got it? Okay, great, thanks. Is there any water coming out of the Okay, I'm just going to... Absolutely. Mm -hmm. 